Personally, yes. No, that's not fair. All, all I know from my experience, Annie, is that I arranged with the is council there, for them to come and see you. And I now hear you cancelled the rap. Oh, but, um, I do, I've worked with someone in the press office for four years and they're telling me this, and I do trust them, yes. So, I don't understand that, you know? <laughs> I think seeing it get in just before it, and there's nothing to do with that, Why did you cancel the term next week? Pokey Little Office, middle of St Mary Church Street. Dave loved it there because it was right by the river. I don't know enough of the, the, the background. When I started there, um, the paper was relatively new, it was the fortnightly version. Um, it all began as a news agency. It's a notoriously difficult world to make any money in uh, the news agency trade. Um, he, he, he had all this source of material and so stories and contacts. And I think he, he started off on a kind of printed A4 page leaflet which was delivered into people's doors by hand. A3 folded down to A4 and it just had basically stories that we'd filed from the Bermondsey area and a bit of extra stuff and that was it. That was Bermondsey News and he said um, yeah I'm gonna file, I'm gonna sell this for 20p a copy. I said Dave nobody's gonna buy it and he did a, a small print run and put them in the local news agent and people bought it. He came back, he, I think he, he put 10 in there, and I think my recollection is right, he sold six, and he came back jingling the money that he'd got from the news agent in his hand, and holding the, the four that hadn't sold. And uh, he said to me, C. Vickery, his nickname for me was Vickery, and he used to say, C. Vickery, look, this is the shape of the future, and I said, Dave, are not gonna, you are not gonna sell this as a newspaper. I think he did 15 the next week and 20 the week after that. And then he started going into other news agents around the area. It was uh, being sold in a shop in uh, just off Broadwife Street. And I went in there one day to get a ba bag of sugar or something and I see this A4, five sheets of A4 stapled in the corner saying burn as you lose. I remember when it first came out, it was, it was fantastic. You know, that we had our own paper. Bermondsey had our own newspaper. It was news just about Bermondsey and Bermondsey people. He would just go and take them in his car and deli deliver them around shops and collect the returns and the cash and all of that and he'd start getting a little book. And it took off to such an extent that the photocopier wouldn't take it anymore. Because we started printing more and more pages and more and more copies to the point where he was printing, I don't know, 100 copies of this thing or something. And the photocopier used to get red hot and break down. It hadn't long, when I joined, it hadn't long been out, so it was still very much a small bit of A4, four pages, then it got to eight pages. We, we thought that was big, that back then we were pleased with that. Um, so it was very, very much early stages of the paper. I think the paper was only about eight or twelve pages big when we broke the story that Mill were going to move the ground, which was huge, huge for the area, and a huge story elsewhere, but we beat everyone else to it. We knew what we were doing journalistically, but advertising, layout, distribution, uh, you know, print buying, all of that stuff, we knew nothing about it, had to learn it all from scratch. All the news, all the sport, all the photographs, and then not just reporting the stories and writing them, taking the pictures, it meant laying the paper out on press night, sticking it all down with cow gum on a big sheet of cardboard. It became a kind of local kind of touchstone for truth. If something was in there, they knew that it must have happened. You know, it must be true because it was in there. And people would come in, people would walk into the office and tell us stuff. People would come in carrying big bundles of documents that they, they weren't supposed to have. And they'd just come in and hand them over to, to Dickie or to me or to Dave. I was a cub reporter really to start with, um, and it really was sink or swim. You went to Tarbridge Magistrates Court, you didn't really know the ins and outs of the law, but you did your best to make your way around it, and you'd get back to the office and Dave would guide you around it. On one occasion we had a, a girl who went to Tarbridge Mags and got things a bit wrong, um, and some guy uh, phoned up and he was effing and blind. Yeah, one particular time I was a witness at a, 
a court case and he, he put down that I was the perpetrator of the thing, so you know, I wasn't very happy with it. Dave had been running the paper for about five years or so. Having a little bit of financial trouble, David was. He kept forgetting that I was an investor in the paper, so therefore a shareholder, not a director. And he would keep, every single year he bought the accounts for me to sign, because I kept saying, I'm not a director, David. <laughs> You're the director. <laughs> world's greatest journalist, world's worst businessman. Absolutely pathetic businessman, I tell you. And I could say that to his face. <laughs> My background was in uh, magazine journalism and then I went on a course uh, where Dave was one of the tutors who was doing news so um, he was teaching news and he phoned me up and said uh, did I want to come and work with him uh, you know, and he said I can offer you half of what you're getting paid now and I thought that sounds like a good deal I'll do that then. There were two of us but then we had um, we had some other people in there I saw an advert for a trainee journalist at Southern News. So I think the advert probably said no experience necessary. Uh, I called Dave up and that was it. Posters went up at our local polytechnic. So I saw it and thought, sounds great for me. So I took the posters down to minimise the number of people that might just go for the job. But I said, yeah, we'll take you on. We've got no money to pay. You didn't get paid for the first three months. And it was 50 quid a month and it was 50 quid a week. I was basically the only person working on the newspaper apart from Dave Clark. Um, I arrived and a couple of other people left. It was basically him and me. And uh, he gave me a week's work experience. And I came along um, doing a bit of football, a bit of news. And at the end of the week, uh, Dave decided to take me on as as the uh, as a new reporter. You know, a small, crap little office. Um, and as soon as he offered uh, me the job in a, in a cracking area of London to be a, a cub reporter, I said, great, yeah, when do I start? And Dave said, yeah, come down and see me, actually, come down to the Ship York pub. And in the first week, he got the front page pitch, I think. I can't remember, I'm trying to still remember there what my first flash was. It came about because they had done a piece on me about a, a play I'd wrote, because I was from Bermondsey, and they'd done a feature on me. And then I got to know Kevin, and because he knew I could write, he knew I liked theatre, he had the... Uh, he asked if, if I'd write theatre reviews now and again. Till quarter past ten at night, you'd been at a council meeting, you'd been to meet a copper. It was just, it was the job. We worked, I think it was about, must have been 30 hours at a stretch. Came in one morning, worked through the night, and carried on working to the next day. Every day was 100 miles an hour. You know, I, would count, I counted once that we did. 200 news stories in the paper one week and there are maybe 50 or 60 sports stories and so that's you know 30 or 40 stories a day. And there was never a huge amount of journalists so your workload from day one um, was, was always very high. Generally I did a lot of the court reporting, um, main contacts with, with the police, the kind of crime stories, court stories. You'd fight for your holidays, you'd fight for any weekend off. So I basically covered everything from uh, the courts, went down to the Tavridge Magistrates Court, it did um, coroners, uh, I did all the council political stuff, so Wednesday night invariably I'd be down at the town hall, um, and I also did covered Millwall. I remember it being not particularly well paid, but I remember it being awful lot of fun. After Hope Sufferance War, um, do they, uh, I think it was, that was rented out, at least through the council, 
um, and they found us a, a another place in West Lane. It wasn't quite what I expected. I, I arrived in the business complex and thought it's going to be that whole floor up there, J Block, and walked up and thought, okay, it's not here, and walked down the corridor and knocked. And there was this tiny little room, our old J Block office, just full of smoke with two people sitting in it, and you couldn't even open the windows because it had a wire cage over the window. And, you know, working there later, so many people used to come in and either ask if we could fix taxi car radios because that was opposite, or just say, oh, sorry, I'm looking for Southern News. Is this like the little side office? Where's the main office? No, no, this is it. This is the Southern News. Clarky was a genius. He was much, much larger than life. I mean, Dave was always cracking off with different ideas, you know. He's not really like anyone. I've ever met since. He's not really like anyone I've met before. Very exacting. He was very demanding. And if you got something wrong, he'd tell you all about it. He was just quite a scary kind of guy when you first get to meet him. He's a big bloke, big personality, very confident. He was fearsome. I was a guy at the office and then I got to know him. I was a guy up there and he'd only give me five minutes of time. Five, ten minutes and then and he just turned around and said to me, that's enough Burke, I'm busy now, go and fuck off. He was really, really hard. He did tend to uh, misquote you a few times, you know, but he was there. If you wanted him there to, to do anything in the town, if I was at the town or if we needed some support, he was always there to help us. Dave was a big, big character, um, a major personality and a, a huge driving force for the paper. I could, even now, I can't fathom the energy and enthusiasm he had for the paper. Dave loved that paper, I mean he, he loved it, it was never about him, it was never about us as individuals. He absolutely loved the paper and he loved the area and he loved the people. So he instilled a bit of that in you, you know, so you're very loyal to the paper and loyal to him and loyal to each other and loyal to the area. But he instilled that in you of, of how proud you were of the team. You know, Dave's drive and obviously you know, Dave Clark's good eye for young people who were hungry and interested in journalism, you know, and Dave obviously spotted us and nurtured us and, you know, gave us the best start we could ever ask for. On a Wednesday we would go to press, if we didn't have a splash, clearly you need a splash, he would stand behind me shouting, give me an S, give me a P, give me an L, and so on, give me a splash, <laughs> which if you're sat there as your, you know, press deadline is rolling, he stood behind you, give it all of that. David would like breathe through his nostrils and go, Charles, come, let's have a chat. And uh, you know, so you'd, you'd go and chat and you'd go to the riverside and when always he, he wanted a chat, he'd want to do it by the river. So you'd stand there at the river and he'd, you know, he'd either be praised saying, I think you've done very well and you know, or, or a bit of a bollocking. He was very honest, he was very intelligent and he was very critical of himself as well as everyone else. If he made a mistake, he would acknowledge it as well. He didn't pretend to be perfect. And he loved telling stories about his time at you know, the Observer, um, in his days in television, and uh, how he brought down a government in the Caribbean and all this kind of thing. And, uh, and he always used to say, you're never a proper journalist until he brought down a government. They made a TV program about it. He upset a lot of people by saying, well, my heart's on the left, yeah, but my wallet's on the right. Once, once he kind of um, you know, let you into the paper and became one of the team. Uh, he was a lovely, lovely bloke, and uh, he'd always make time. You know, if you didn't understand something, even when it was a bit of time pressure, to explain a point or tell me why something I'd written we couldn't write it like that, or why he, we sh I should rearrange it uh, a little bit, um, and then always a constant um, advice when I needed it. Trying to run a local newspaper in an area like Bermondsey. Where there isn't much money around, people haven't got much money to spend on advertising. It was an incredibly difficult job. He gave Bermondsey an extra voice. Bermondsey always had a voice, you know, and sometimes it could shout pretty loudly. But he gave it an extra voice and he gave it a platform. Um, and for one man to do that for any area, you know, it's a, 
amazing achievement. He just seemed to be really concerned about what, you know, bringing you up, making you really, really good at your, at your job. Is, is this the end of the South News or, you know, obviously you didn't have too much time, the paper still had to come out, so it's still on everyone's mind, we still got to try and get the paper out. Huge shot. So I picked up the pieces the best I could and uh, that meant looking after David's estate, providing for his son. The biggest guy that came in was, was and then dealing with all of, 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 uh, of the um, Dave, uh, Dave Will was Barry Alton Dyer. And he sort of said, look, you know, don't worry about the, the situation there. You guys go, carry on doing what you, Dave asked you to do and bring out the paper. So we couldn't physically bring the paper out having had such the main person go on a weekly basis. It went back fortnightly. You know, me and Kevin very much learning the game. And suddenly, uh, in walks Peter Victor, production editor of The Independent. In walks uh, Damon Green, hotshot reporter at uh, London Tonight. Uh, Matt Smith at London Tonight, Dickie Davis, Greg Whelan from Sky Sports News just came and helped us out and turned up in their own times. They all had families and girlfriends and wives to look after and beer to drink. But no, they came on Tuesday night, Monday night, edited our stuff, make sure we didn't get libeled by anybody, which we would have done several times, I'm sure, had they not done that, and gave up their own time for quite a while, for many months, uh, to make sure the paper kept going, that the standard was good, that, that, that we didn't make some terrible howler. And uh, that tells you all you need to know about Dave Clark, I think. Simon Hughes was quite good, he'd come in. And when he died, the, res the, the, the amount of obituaries that were in the Guardian, everywhere, about how respectful he's had, brought down the Caribbean government, how it, how it you know, had big interviews with Mark Thatcher, how it worked with Dark Darkest Howe on a lot of uh, more radical press to begin with. When Clarky went, the lads rallied, and we'd all, first of all, en masse, go there and say, right, what stories have you got, lads? Kev, let's see what you've got, let's see what you've got, chaps. Great, yeah, that's a splash. Right, where's that going? Yeah, we can lay that out. Let's put that there. That's a great page three. What's your best sports story? Let's do that. Um, I guess the lads learnt from that. They'd already learnt a lot from Clarky, but the lads learnt from that. And they've done really well to take it on since then, because at that stage we just didn't know if it could keep going. Because there were things that David taught us, like laying out a newspaper, but we'd only done a few. You know, there was never any question of not going back. For, for most of us who went back, there was, you know, we'll keep going and we'll keep it alive as long as we can. And these people came and wrote stories for about three months, you know, week after week, for nothing. Came and then disappeared, came and then disappeared, and on press day, you know, there would be about eight of them come in. I mean, that's what he put inside them. They, they felt they owed him so much. And it became like a crusade to keep the paper going. We had all this, you know, pool of, of journalists that had been taught the Dave Clark School of Journalism coming back to help us. You know, we were in there in the evenings, a good few of us who'd worked there before helping out with layout and all of that stuff uh, until it could get back on its feet fully. It's a measure of how important it was to all of us that we were all there at that time. It was a measure of how big an imprint he'd left on all of our lives. And we, knew, we all knew and know how much that place influenced our careers.
I joined in January 99, so it was just a few months after Dave Clark had passed away, uh, and there was myself and Vinny and Kev. And uh, Chris, actually, you know, uh, Kevin and I hired him, um, uh, gave him some work experience, and then uh, gave him his first job in journalism. Nothing but admiration uh, for the two guys, you know, who picked it up when effectively, you know, when, when Dave passed away. I personally thought that was it. Personally, I owned the whole paper by then. And, and then we had Kevin and Chris, you know, who gave their heart and soul to it. And I, and I suddenly realised it wasn't about me, the paper. You know, for four or five, five, five years, Bar Barry was the, the, the owner of, of, the, of the newspaper. And Barry had supported us well. I mean, we had only one person working on advertising. I mean, there was, I, don't, I think it was for a number of years, an absolute, even under Dave in some respects, an absolute lost earner. I mean, it wasn't making enough money. You've got to make money in advertising on it. You know, Kevin as ever, battling away, and Chris, you know, doing their very, very best. And we'd gone back to weekly quite quickly, which was a real achievement, I think, because we'd gone fortnightly when Dave died, because the paper was reading uh, from, from his death. And we'd raised circulation, and I just thought, time for me to move on, and Kevin was thinking the same. And we spoke to Barry Alvin, who owned the paper then, and he said, well, I'm a funeral director, I love what I do, I've kept the paper going because I love the area and I think it's a good paper and does a good job, but it, it's, not, you know, it's not me, I'm not a newspaper man, so why don't you try and buy the paper off me? So we spent a good part of a year trying to work out whether that was what we wanted to do, because it's a huge leap to go from being a journalist who's about to try and get into nationals, which is the, the route that so many of our journalists have done, which is fantastic to see, or to suddenly go to running a business and you're doing accounts and you're chasing debt and you're running a sales team and you're just getting away from what you originally intended to do and you're in one place as well rather than going off and working elsewhere. All I did was to hold the historical mantle of the paper for a little while. I'm not a journalist. I write books. I don't think he'd be good at it. He might have written a book, but I don't think he'd be good at producing the newspaper, and he'd say that himself. So he offered to buy it to myself and, and Chris. We spent a year putting together a business plan, thinking, do we want to or not, but, but saying we were interested. And that's when we met David Ellis, who is a print man by trade, knows everything there is about print, and came in to see me about a print contract, and just sussed out that something was happening and, and said, you know, you guys, what's, what's going on? We spoke to him, he was interested in investing, so we, we went ahead, the three of us. And when I found them, I mean, it was a hilarious little office. It wasn't this one, it was a tiny little office on the other side. And you tripped over people that, uh, you know, and obviously kicked the night there, and there was a tiny little table, and everyone was back to back. And it was, I talk about a smoke-filled room, and you couldn't see from one end of it to the other. And there was... Uh, Jean, who was the accountant's, or accounts lady, smoking like a chimney. Kevin on the other side, smoking like a chimney. And uh, somehow, once you got through the fog, uh, you actually found what was going on. But yeah, I think he was just ready to go. Black and white and smudgy and uh, a little tiny bit of full colour. And the potential was tremendous with somewhere like Southern was coming up so fast. And I said, look, you deserve to own this, not me. And over a period of a few years, and at a very, very low rate, we, we transferred the paper to them, and well deserved. And that was, we concluded it June 2002. Start for the starts come from Bermondsey people to Summit people before everyone can relate to it. You mentioned your street, your state, your club, a lot of people you know was in there. That was Dave that did that. I want to put on record. <laughs> because I'm, a, I'm a, everyone around here was like, they all went in Bermondsey News, right? And at those early years, I, you know, obviously I was jumping to think about the finance, didn't think about the editorial advertising situation was very different for me now. But he recognised that it had to be bigger than just Bermondsey because 
much as he loved it, and much as Bermondsey is still the heartland of the paper, you can't run a, a newspaper on, on... It's hard to, harder to run a paper in such a small area. Uh, and that's why they expanded it to Southwark. To get the advertising in, and a lot of money you have to get from some Council as well, we had to change it, we had to expand it out. If the, all the Bermondsey businesses supported us as much uh, in terms of buying the paper, if they did it in the same way taking their adverts, then it would have remained the Bermondsey News. No, I always call it the Bermondsey News. Uh, as everyone else calls it, as everyone in Bermondsey is, you know, it, the people feel it, it's their paper. It is the voice of Bermondsey, and everyone will always call it the Bermondsey News. I, I think it's sort of a, I think it catches in the throat calling, calling it Southern News. The only thing me and Chris changed was the, we changed the banner and stuff to make it, you know, show a different, different era. I did six months unpaid work experience as you did in those days. Oh, they all looked after me very well. It was uh, Vinny, Kev and Chris. Uh, Chris had only just started on work experience when I was there as well. I first came here on work experience and did three months here and then I actually got a proper pay job in, in a paper in Dagenham and worked there for a year and then um, they gave me a call after about a year when someone left when there was a place open so I came back. Um, I'd sort of had experiences at other places, at news and sport places. Um, the news, when I did news I never really liked it, I never felt that I was part of the furniture and, and you know it got to a point I went to um, a news agency for one day's work experience and it was, um, it was horrible, I hated it. I was doing my, NC, my NCTJ course uh, teaching me all the nuts and bolts of being a journalist and that was work experience so they suggested I do it in my local paper so I came here. Chris and Kevin came to me and said they wanted to have a, uh, a dedicated arts page and could I write a regular piece, pieces for that arts page. I mean it's been good in terms of other work experience I've done just because they've you know they really give you a lot to do and you're pretty much doing the job of a journalist and so no it's been a, it's been it's been a great experience. I, I like to chuck in at the deep end and, and see who kind of sinks or swims that way you can spot who are the kind of good prospects and so on so and I try and, and sit down with them and talk about their stories, where they're going wrong and what they're doing right and so on. So they tried to rob the HSBC in the branch of Bermondsey and got a, you know, police apps out in the windows and with stun grenades and caught them. He's getting his name on the front page, but for us as well, you know, I mean, as we've reduced our staff, we really, you know, there's work experience people, it's, we really do need them. And good work experience people is, you know, they, it's, it's mutually beneficial because it really helps us a hell of a lot because we are, you know, very busy with what we do. We try to split up. The journalists, so you've got a Bermondsey and I'm a journalist, and you've got a Dulwich journalist. I cover Burham Bankside, Bermondsey Rutherhide, Dulwich, and all the sport that isn't in a Millwall shirt. I also write uh, the weekly history feature as well, and I do in the dock. Mine at that time was just Camberwell, um, but as time's gone on and some of uh, our journalists, we've had less full time journalists. It's increased to Woolworth, to Elephant the Castle, to Peckham, to Nunhead. I used to write the history page. And I used to set out the history page and I'd do the arts. Um, East Dunnage, where I lived, Peckham, Nunhurst. Um, I also um, did the court reporting um, from um, Tabbridge Magistrates Court once a week. And um, I also did the uh, food and drink um, review page. Peckham, Nunhead, uh, Dulwich, East Dulwich. I was covering from sort of borough. From, from basically from London Bridge, uh, almost to Blackfriars, where you know the border of Southwark, uh, Borough, um, Bermondsey, Rotherhithe, so the whole sort of North River stretch of uh, of, of Southwark. And um, I was also the history uh, columnist. So you'd come in on a Tuesday and work all through Tuesday, all through Tuesday night, and finish sort of Wednesday afternoon. Oh, Tuesday nights through to Wednesday mornings, yeah, every week. That was, it was long, and it was difficult. They were long weeks, you know, I mean, on average we all worked six or seven days a week with that overnight on a Tuesday as well, but it was worth it. You can play cricket in the corridor at four in the morning just because your eyes were going all blurred. A full council meeting, and we all had different reasons to go. That's when there was me and Steve and Ewan and Will. We all had different reasons to go because normally we wouldn't all go. But we all went that time, and we were all on our bikes. So we went from the office to um, Campbell to Southwark Town Hall on our bikes, like the Red Hand Gang or something. 
it was pretty disorganized at first, but it's gotten a lot better um, with the amount of work and just meeting the deadlines, and especially with the weekender, that one's been a tough one because it's changed a lot, but we're slowly realizing that we have to get ads and the copy in a lot sooner um, for it to be produced on time and for us to be able to go home <laughs> a little slightly earlier than, you know, I think 10 o'clock was the latest I was here one night. I think it was Chris decided that, you know, we could actually meet the deadlines. I think people just wanted to get a free takeaway that happened if you stayed late. So we started finishing at 6 and that was, it was possible to do it. Some people had more trouble with the deadlines than others. Apparently they don't work late into the night anymore as much as they used to when I was there. Um, yeah, not really late. We always made it for closing time, last orders. Our main core readership, buying the Sun News for um, family announcements in the dock, Millwall. Shadow is extremely popular, you know, he's got a massive following. The history, brilliant in terms of bridging two gaps, because history will, um, to the people that are from the area, it's their history, but then for new people that moved in the area, it's fascinating to know that you're living here and, and down the road uh, you're, you're moving to Shad Thames, and you know that's, that is the scene that was set for Charles Dickens Oliver or Fagan would have been roaming around there or a Fagan-like character. So I go straight to the back to see how Fisher and Millwall are doing, my, you know, my two teams around here. Then I go straight to the middle page, which is all the letters. Usually the births and death section is quite a revelation because you see a few old, old faces that you uh, grew up with and that passing away and it, it makes you realise that you're going to die one day. You're not not going to forever. And I, I'm particularly proud of the uh, the announcements, you know, when they actually have a death. The amount of people in Bermsey now who maybe ten years ago never thought it important at all to put it in the paper. I was always proud of what the paper achieved. The Dangerous Dogs Act, we'd started off with a pit bull story of dead cats found in Burgess Park where the RSPCA said pit bull fighting is going on down here because this is the mark that they're being trained down here and that spun off, the papers picked it up and ran with it and ran with it and ran with it, the Dangerous Dogs Act came out of that. We jumped on a campaign that we agreed with and that was run by a woman called Kate Subby and a grandma from the Four Squares whose kids couldn't get into a school. It resulted in getting all the parties to support it, it resulted in us saying yes we'll go for a City Academy status and getting the City of London to sponsor Academy and get that school built, which is City Academy built in, in Bermondsey. We took a lot of stick for that from local people who said, you know, you've, you've defended green spaces but you're happy to have a school built. And we did editorials saying, yes, in an ideal world you wouldn't build on a green space, but there isn't an alternative here. That was our best campaign because it actually physically ended in a school being built and a really good school. One which uh, I was uh a part of as well was the Save Guys, the Save Guys campaign. You only got to think about how many people rely on it to get their stories out. Tennis associations, councillors, MPs. I have a lot of praise for something they did for me personally. I had a bereavement on this estate, my flatmate died, and thanks to your editor, they got me um, to put him where he wanted to go in the end. Quite often everything would be speeded up by, or, or it seemed like it was, they'd phone us back next week and be like, oh it's brilliant, you know, the council have been down here and they've got rid of all my rats or you know whatever and they, they've, they've finally fixed the heating or whatever. It's a, uh, <laughs> Tommy was one of those and I think the brother phoned up and said he's no angel but he never did this. But uh, Tommy, Tommy got off the, uh, Tommy got off, a couple of local guys banged up for years for armed robberies. We got we started the campaign, ended up back in court, they got off. And it turned out that her son uh, was an alcoholic and he'd been taking her rent money and telling her he was paying it and then just spending it. And we just argued surely in this day and age the council could do an attachment to, to earnings or, or the equivalent for her who was receiving a pension to deduct it at source. 
But even when they found out that he'd been spending the money, sure you'd have a victim woman who's nearly 90 years old. So we ran a big campaign. And even though she lived in Peckham, it was Burnley's people who got together three and a half thousand pounds. And they just didn't want it, they were so embarrassed. And we were refusing to accept it. And we said, here's the money, we paid off her debt, put her back in her house. That was great, you know, just to pull her back and see how happy she was. And blue plaques, get the blue plaques up. First year we did blue plaques, we got ten and a half thousand votes. And we did a thing called uh, Shop a Shop a Crack Dealer. And, uh, and that just cleared it up. It was amazing. And people just got straight on the phone straight away. And I was just like, wow, that's like an amazing thing for a paper to do. The paper's changed from the one piece of paper that came through our door into uh, a paper as it is now. I think the, the production of the paper now is far superior than it ever was. Um, um, you know, it's a much slicker operation, um, but it's still got that spirit. Um, you know, from, from its source and it's still got that fighting spirit about it, which I love. To me, it's, it's much more professional. It's a much more professional product. No two ways about it. Five years ago, it was 28 pages. Some of those is now 40, 48 pages. The leap it's made since it was first started, it started as a couple of stapled A4 sheets for 20p in local news agents, Burnley News, done the typewriter, it looked like. And now, you know, some weeks we were producing over like 100 pages. We just couldn't believe how fantastic it looked. We went down the Queen Vic on, on the balloon, we're handing out free copies to everyone and announcing it to, the, to everyone who listened about how it changed. But it just got bigger and looked completely different. A risk for us, but it looked too tabloidy. It looked kind of like News of the World, the old one. And I don't think that's what we're about. Dave didn't want by that until he, oh, I don't know why he didn't have them. Myself and Vinny, or myself and Chris, had sort of went, Hold on one minute, do you know, um, why, why don't we do bylines? This company wasn't used to doing a lot of full colour, so I arranged for a contract with the London Typesetting Centre to do the full colour pages. I brought in an advertising agent to do the, uh, sell the classified advertising. It was always a good local paper anyway, but it's got more of the other things that local papers have now, you know, it's built up a property section, it's got, they've got the Southern Weekender now as well, which was something that you couldn't even imagine in the days I was working there. The way they are now, you know, you go up in the office, there's so many people now. The workforce has expanded definitely on recent in terms of advertising, but that is, it's really competitive and as you say the area has gone up. It's, there's a lot more people, you know, there's a lot more new business in, but there's a lot of people fighting for, um, every, you know, we have more, more competition than ever now, but you need the people to be able to go out there and get the money to allow these people to create the product. So, from, a, from being a journalist, I think that's my biggest um, learning curve in terms of newspapers. I've had to learn to be a bit more like a, uh, uh, an owner of a newspaper and someone that understands advertising. But I think Southern News is very different to a lot of local papers because it's, it's not part of a large publishing empire. It's independent. The people who run it, own it, work for it, um, are, are all absolutely passionate and believe in it. It's what makes the paper what it is. Everyone else sells out. I love the fact that we, have, and our, we give our journalists freedom to write things. It, it, it brings... You look at some of the big titles and they just all have a a line for certain editorial issues and it's hard to take them seriously when they have that because it's not the editor deciding it, it's the person who owns the business who just said this is our line on this. I think as soon as it gets uh, involved with big large consultants and newspapers I think it loses, it loses its, uh, its touch with local people. Clarky would never ever let anyone have any control over the paper, we control the paper and if it upset people it upset people but we were there to tell people honestly what was happening in the area. Um, it's always going to be tough being an independent newspaper, you know, in such a competitive market, you know, newspapers at the moment, are, you know, everything, everything seems to be conspiring against them with the internet and 24 hour news, news coverage. And it's hard sometimes being independent because you don't have big pockets and you're competing against people, companies with billions of pounds. Plenty of independent free ones I think, but I think that's the only paid one. It's against all odds, an independent newspaper in the centre of London, a paid for independent newspaper, is pretty unique. In one evening I had a Liberal Democrat, a Tory and a Labour person come up and have a pop at me. I was we were calling you and your bloody Tory news, you and your bloody Lib Dem rag and your Labour propaganda. I thought we're doing something right, but they're all fed up with us. You don't want to just do it gratuitously, but 
we don't have a political allegiance. You begin to realise, especially when you get people coming in to work for you that have worked in other newspapers and, and, and worked for other groups, notice that that's, that's our, that is so unique for us because we are the only independent in London, we're the only one that's, that, that, that you know, every, everyone else is owned by a big media group. I think it's the defining thing for Southern News and I do think that people locally love the fact that it's independent. It's got to stay independent because you're, you're, you're just lose, uh, you just lose ev everything about it. I learnt how to be a journalist. I think I learnt everything I know about journalism at the Southern News. I learnt an awful lot in the first six months a year about journalism, just about papers, about deadlines and how to craft stories and what the top line is and how to ask the right questions of people, but also just about that it's not, you can write the best article in the world, but if you miss the deadline it's worthless. Um, I learnt lots of new things, lots of computer work that I didn't know. Um... Sort of graphics and Adobe and Photoshop and things. Without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, it didn't so much help my career, it made my career. If I hadn't been at Southeast News and if I hadn't worked at Bermondsey News stroke Southwark News, then I certainly wouldn't be here now. All of the things I learned there, including how to survive 18 hour days, stood me in great stead when I went on to national newspapers. I couldn't understand why everybody was going home so early. We've got such a small organisation, I've got experience in so many different facets of, of newspaper. You know, I've got experience as a, as, a, as, a, as a news writer, I've got experience as a sports writer, I've got experience as a features writer. I suppose I'd, I'd learnt how to be a, a journalist, um, which I, I wasn't entirely clear on before. I mean, technically I've learned lots of stuff just on, on how to lay out a newspaper, that kind of thing, and, and how to write stories, but also I've progressed from being a reporter up kind of through the ranks as well, so I've learned a lot about how to run a newspaper editorially as well as a, a business as well, and I'm still learning now, so. You, you learned more in, I don't know, six months or a year there than you could you could pick up in a, some people in their whole careers. In national newspapers never do as much as some of those kids do in, on, on Southern News in a year. When I first started, compared to now, and just sort of how I've grown with the Southern News and with, um, my abilities of producing things. It's the richest experience of my life so far. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, ne I'll never forget it, but it set me up as a journalist. That environment was made for anybody, anyone who wanted it, you got it there. You got no better grounding, I'd say, anywhere in the country than there. You had everything. You had Towerbridge Magistrates Court, you had the armed robbery squad at Towerbridge, you had some great villains, you had some great contacts, you had Simon Hughes, hard working MP, virtually everything on that patch you had and if you wanted it, you could go and get it. You had a lot of talent coming through there, but you know, at the time they were young and hungry and prepared to work all the hours God sends. Of course they all moved on to Thames TV and London Tonight and The Times and I was just amazed that people could go from a little paper like this to a job like that. You've got some of the top people in, in, in TV and radio and all sorts and they all came through there, sort of worked till they were nearly dead, then escaped. I'm not sure I'd be where I am today if it wasn't for the Bermondsey News because you, it gave you the perfect grounding in digging out stories, hard work, loyalty. I started doing shifts at the BBC straight from working at Southern News. Um, from there I went on to The Sun, The News of the World, I've worked at The Independent on Sunday, um, I've worked for BBC London and ITV London. And my last, I've left. Although I've left journalism now, I'm now in public relations. Um, it's you know the grounding that Southern News gave me was second to none. The Independent on Sunday, and um, my title is Executive Editor News. I work for Soccer Saturday, which is the results program on Sky Sports on a Saturday afternoon. I'm now working for Sky Sports. I work for Sky Sports News. I'm commissioning editor at Woman Magazine. After um, Southern News, um, I worked for a financial publication, um, and after that, um, I went on to Reuters, you know, which is one of the most um, res you know, respected um, journalistic bodies in, in the UK. I still do it. You know, I've got different little publications that I'm writing for. I do um, a lot of stuff um, for the local court. They, I have history stuff for them that I do. They like to know about crime through the ages. I went from the Southern News to uh, National News 
which uh, is a sort of news agency in sort of the cup of London. Um, and I was, but I, I got a traineeship position at the Times when I sort of just as I started there. So, so I worked. I started at the Times in the September of that year. I take real satisfaction from that. I've seen them change and develop as as journalists, and then they go on to bigger and better things. But they still love the news. The reporters that were there were really involved in it and really passionate about it. The paper's always been a little bit edgy, always been a little bit different, and that's what sets it apart from every other paper. That's why it's so good. Yeah, Farmers he News is exemplary in promoting local uh, projects uh, in the community. There's just a lot more creative freedom here. Uh, One of the things that's important, I think, now is postcode publishing. Rather than our opposition, South London Press, stretches from Croydon across to the other side of South West London, back across. It's, it's a shotgun approach that you, you're, you're, you're nothing to, to a lot of people because people really, if there is any news happening in South London, they see it on the television, they hear it on the radio. South London Press, for one thing, is Streatham. If you don't live in Streatham, then forget it. Yourself. That's all they do in South London Press is Streatham. Very, very little around this area. Oh, someone called it a South London Depressed because it's just so full of horrible news that you just don't even want to live where you live anymore. Well, I don't really care what, what goes on in Clapham. I don't care what goes on in Wandsworth. <laughs> I just don't care. And maybe it's something I shouldn't say, but we even have a subscription list and it, in prison because it's people think, well, I'll, I'm locked up 24-7, well, uh, quite a nice thing to know what's going back home, what's happening back home. Oh, yes, Mr Dickie Davis, I was in uh, Smellside for a little while. He used to send me uh, every week a nice little letter to tell him what's going on. It was nice to receive what's going on in Bermondsey. Our biggest subscription list is, is, is Kent in terms of us people that it's a reflection of what's happened in the, in the area, and I'd say it's Bermondsey, Rotherham, Peck and Campbell, the old area, that people have moved out. But if you want to know what's going on in your area, then you, you need a local paper. You know, you, you find out about your community, you find out what's going on in your area. It doesn't be very important, it doesn't mean no one else does, and that is to accurately reflect the life of this borough. Other than local newspapers cover the area, in inverted commas, but they don't cover the life that people live around here, and it does that. Stories that um, you know the the national press um, don't necessarily um, pick up on do need airing. It's a local paper for local people, and uh, we take campaigns very seriously, and we try to make a difference. Anything that happens outside Southwark is not our remit. And I think that what they do is give a purpose to local people, a platform and a purpose. It's the first person you turn, you don't go to the South London, you turn straight away to the Bermondsey News. And people trust it in a way they don't trust the bigger papers. Everyone who reads it, they'll tell you how important it is to have that paper. It keeps all the people well informed of what's going on, because it's needed and it's a necessity for the area. They knew the paper was really important here to people. Uh, and I believe it is now. People really cared, people were really interested in what we produced and that's something to be proud of. I mean it was a great, great laugh. Uh, you were learning a lot but you didn't know you were learning it, you were absorbing it through the skin. I loved it, I loved every minute of it. There are very few places I've worked since where you've had that tight family spirit and the sense of satisfaction you get when you achieve it because you know, there were some weeks it was near impossible but we did it. Clarkie said, no matter what you achieve in life, no matter how successful you become, you'll never enjoy your time as much as you did here, and he's absolutely right. It's good to kind of be your own boss, and everyone is to that, to, to a certain extent, extent their own boss. It's good just to be in a job where you're kind of the master of your own destiny, really. The thing I just remember a lot is, one, you know, brilliant place to learn, learn your trade. Uh, with Dave, you know, it was it really was a mentor. But actually, we just had a lot of fun as well. You actually care about it, and it means something to you, rather than if you're in a bigger place, it's more just a job. It was more like a little family thing, you know. It wasn't like a job. Most of the newspapers I've been at, you've got the advertising people on one floor, 
and then the um, you know the journalists on another floor, and the two never really mix. But here it's like everybody who produces the paper is in one room, and it's a really tight team, and there's a really good atmosphere. And I think it was that sort of there really was a kind of camaraderie there. We'd stay late on a Tuesday night getting the paper, and then we'd go to the pub. Yeah, the job satisfaction is so much more than if you're just a cog in a machine. I really loved the people that I was working with, and it was never boring. I just remember, you know, feeling like I was part of, um, you know, a team of people that were really dedicated to the work that they were doing. Um, I had real happy memories. Um, you know, it was okay. There were some late nights, but you know, we always got pizza in <laughs> or something like that. We always managed to punch above our weight and just keep on going because we've got a lot of people who are kind of really committed and we just work loads of hours and just put the effort in. And I think that the friends that I made is a bit news. I will be friends. The best thing about the paper was the friendships that you forged and I'm still friends with virtually everyone who worked there through the years. It was the best job I ever had. You know, we had some great times there. It was, it was long, it was hard, but we had so much fun doing it. Every week you, you were so proud of what you produced and it, it's, it's, the, it's the best job I ever had. What I've always wanted and I think that's what Dave wanted as well, and definitely what me and what, me, what Chris wants, and two of us have always been on one in this Porsche, is that we want Southwark News to be synonymous with Southwark. Anything, if you live in any part of Southwark. So money, money and uh, resources are going, especially human resources, are going into the website. So that's the future, I think. So we'll have rolling news every day. I mean, the website's probably, you know, as good as any I've seen. I'd like to get to the stage where Everyone here just doesn't just work because they have a real sense of loyalty, but they actually really love coming to work. And we're trying to achieve that, but I don't know if we're there yet. But uh, you'd like to feel that your staff are really happy where they work. It's something to aim for, I suppose, but that comes with more revenue through the door. Everything gets easier. Now it's established and alive. It's not, it, you know, there, was, there were times when it could have fallen over and not got back up again. Now I think if it falls over, dust itself off, get up and keep going. If you've seen how much we've changed in the last five years, let alone 20 years, then uh, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future. The word Bermondsey seems to have a slight sort of taboo about it. A lot of people don't like to mention it, you know, in the Bermondsey news when it first started off in 20 years ago, I was so proud of seeing a, uh, some sort of magazine or something on the shelf saying Bermondsey. It makes you proud to be working for that paper because you know the amount of work that goes into it in a very small team. If you've put blood, sweat and tears into a thing, you're part of it, but it's also part of you. You know, you, it never really leaves you. Yeah, you still get the paper sent to me. I speak to the lads uh, on a regular basis. I count them as friends. It's a big part of my life for an awful long time. Clarky would have been proud. There's no question about it, the paper that they do now is what he would like to have achieved. To this day it still keeps very much on that, that winning formula that, that they set up. But you get real pride from, from seeing the product and you get real pride from having good staff as well. We're still going strong as, a, 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 as two um, manager directors working side by side even though people, a lot of people look at the differences between us and not actually realise there must be a lot, we must be thinking very much the same for us to be able to continue to run a newspaper together. Hello, he got, he's got a different accent or, you know. Chris, the posh boy, uh, Kevin, the Bermondsey boy. And, uh, you know, it, it, I've just watched with, uh, not surprised, but just pure, I'm thrilled that the paper is, is as it is now. It's an important part of uh, Bermondsey. If there was some kind of disaster, people would rally round to ensure that the paper continued, just as just like it did when Dave Clark died. It's impossible to overestimate what he did for Bermondsey. How it's progressed from that early beginning to what it's become now, I can't see it ever ending. I can't see anything that can happen that can, that can stop the Southwark news being published. If I had a message for everyone in Southwark is, buy it, you won't regret it. 
Let's hope we can celebrate a 40th and a 50. But I won't be here. I'll be with Barry Elvin. started researching the history and Kev came up and was going, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I was going to do this um, project, like maybe for the history page or something about the old Kent Road. And he goes, what do you think this is, press gang? <laughs> uh, it just really made me laugh because I actually didn't think it was press gang. <laughs> and a lot of people in prison. That's one of our lots of the week, getting sent that every week. Seems he was in there, seems to join them. <laughs> we can't <cut> that. <laughs> He's got a two. If he come down and see me in Southside next week. <laughs> you know that's true or not. <laughs> then you just get him. <laughs> you just get him. Oh, he's, he's got a two. He'll be down here next week. That's what they're getting, Ken. Yeah, I've been carrying for another 20 years. We thought I'd be 47. Down at the den, the lions run free. Cause we're all going to Cardiff, you see. We've waited so long. I had a lovely head of black hair before I started. So come on, you lion, and make it our day. Hey, nobody likes us, but we don't care. Nobody likes us, but we don't care. Nobody likes us, but we don't care. We're the mighty Millwall, and we will be there. Do you read the Southwark news? Local newspaper. Oh, is it? Yeah. What, do you read that? That yeah. one that comes out on the Thursday, all about round here. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. Do you read it? Oh, good. Yeah, you read when, it? when I get it from Athens, so yeah. dear, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 30 pence is the cheapest paper in town. Do you reckon so? What's cheaper? Uh, I don't know. I forgot now. There ain't none. <laughs> there ain't none cheaper. Oh, no, the sun's 35. Nobody likes us, but we don't care. Nobody likes us, but we don't care. Nobody likes us, but we don't care. We all got to Cardiff, and we were all there. So when he said he was going to do this, I just thought, nah, they're not going to buy it, Dave. You know, the, the public just aren't going to stand for it. Well, how wrong was I? Sing me the best thing in London if that's yeah. what you used to sing. No, yeah. 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 Yeah.